Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 565 Suddenly Autumn. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I am very well because it is suddenly the fall outside. Ah, <sighs> brought here by Ida. Evidently, we uh, had a tornado. We had several tornado warnings. And had to have dinner in the basement. But there were seven, actually seven tornadoes that landed very near us. Some nearer than others. One was only about five miles away. It was close enough. And the rain was lots. If you Google New Hope, September 1st, 2021, and flooding, you will find some rather extraordinary pictures of uh, river levels that are up to the top of bridges, you know, where the actual road (laughs) part of the bridge is. Yeah, it was a lot of water. And evidently it was both the speed of how fast the rain came down, but also with the Delaware, there's always the problem of upriver. There are several different reservoirs. And if they open their floodgates, quickly, (laughs) lots of water comes down. So it's a drying out time. They've actually asked everybody to just stay away. They closed the school. So Aiden has had his first day of school of senior year. Yes, indeed. And then nothing. He is out of school yesterday. He's out of school today. And Monday is Labor Day. And Tuesday's Rosh Hashanah. And so he will have his second day of senior year one week after his first day of senior year. <laughs> he, as as you might imagine, is kind of bummed because his first day was actually really good. And yet he gets to sleep in and, you know, hang out and write music and stuff. So is he traumatized? No, he is not. And his, his brother, the former thing one, uh, popped into the Zoom chat last night to say hi to Candy, who Aaron was on the trip to Scotland that Candy was on. So that was a lot of fun. And I continue to do the watercolor thing. I'm still finding that and tearing paper to to be very calming. And I'm finally starting to gain some control over water and color as they relate to watercolors. It turns out that the water part is actually way harder than the color part. (laughs) I had no idea. No idea. That was what it was all going to hinge upon. Not enough water and one bad thing happens, too much water and a very different bad thing happens. And so it needs to be the Goldilocks water. It needs to be just the right amount. I wanted to pass on my thanks from me, but also from Krista. Many, many of you went to the GoFundMe to help out with the costs of Krista's very beloved dog's upcoming surgery. She has almost made enough to pay for the surgery. I cannot grok the amount of money vet bills can amount to. And and this is a big one. So huge, huge, huge thanks both from Krista and from me for your help in that matter. The GoFundMe is is still linked in the show notes uh, in case you didn't get a chance to last week. We'll make it convenient. And also, I would like to thank everybody who went and donated to Tracy. Yesterday evening on the Zoom call, Tracy was there having that day, yesterday, picked up her husband's ashes. And I have to tell you, Tracy, as an ambassador for all of Craftlet, really showed us proud because the, the urn that she chose for her husband, who is also a a book lover. Michael is now residing in a set of books. 
that look like classic leather-bound books. So he's there. He can be on a shelf, surrounded by the things that he and, and Tracy love, books, and kind of blend in and be one with that environment, which I think is, is remarkably peaceful. And I, I love that this kind of urn exists. And I love that Tracy selected it. It was so awesome. And she shared a, a picture with all of us who were on the Zoom chat last night. And it, it just made me smile. So thank you all for just being the wonderful you that you are. So books. So let's talk about the Leavenworth case. The only thing I'm going to tell you before we listen is this. You will hear a word confab, C-O-N-F-A-B, kind of a, a private discussion, a private conference between two entities. I heard this word and I thought, well, now that's odd, 1878. How did you have this word confab in you <laughs> in 1878? And it turns out, thank you, Oxford English Dictionary, that confab is actually not a modern word. The first time the OED claims, uh, and I am not going to dispute the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary tells us that 1701 was the first usage of confab. However, the etymology says it's a shortening of the word confabulation, which is the same thing, talking together, familiar talk or a conversation or a chat. Confabulation was first used as far as the, the OED tracks in 1450, and that's because it comes from Latin. It is a noun of action, confabulari, and yeah, so it goes way back. It also has been used humorously, according to the OED, where a room full of people kind of blow into a confabulation, so it's like everybody's talking to everybody else. And also in psychiatry, talking about confabulations are hallucinations that include you, the patient, speaking to them, the voices in your head, which I thought was kind of interesting too. Anyway, it's not used that way in our story. It is used the way it's supposed to be, a private conversation. I just found it supremely modern sounding in context. And as many, many people have let me know we're all in agreement this book sounds often far more modern than it actually is which is really cool so today is going to be i believe another one of those days so we're going to listen to chapters four and five and if any of you know anything about inquests and can explain to the rest of us why chapter four is called a cuts a, capital A, next word, C-U-T-S. I would love to have you call it. I don't know. Maybe it has nothing to do with inquest. Maybe it has to do with being a butcher. I have no idea what she is sub-referencing here, and I couldn't find anything. So I'm expecting it's kind of a term of art from a particular profession that either has fallen by the wayside or is such a term of art that it's really only used by that profession. So I can't help you there. I got nothing. But I do have two chapters. So chapter four, A Cuts. Chapter five, Expert Testimony. Oh, and I will tell you, Expert Testimony is given by a guy who works at a place called Bon and Company, B-O-H-N. Our narrator pronounces it like bone and being an inquest, it's kind of disconcerting to have this particular guy come from a place called Bone or Bones. So B-O-H-N, just, just so you know. All right, here we go, listening to Anna Catherine Green's book, The Leavenworth Case, read for us by Kevin Green of LibriVox, chapters four and five. Here we go. Chapter 4. A Cuts Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Hamlet The cook of the establishment being now called, that portly, ruddy-faced individual stepped forward with a clarity, 
displaying upon her good-humoured countenance such an expression of mingled eagerness and anxiety that more than one person present found it difficult to restrain a smile at her appearance observing this and taking it as a compliment being a woman as well as a cook she immediately dropped a curtsey and opening her lips was about to speak when the coroner rising impatiently in his seat took the word from her mouth by saying sternly your name catherine malone sir well catherine how long have you been in mr leavenworth's service sure it's a good twelve months now sir since i came on mrs wilson's recommendation uh, to that very front door and never mind the front door but tell us why you left this mrs wilson sure and it was she as left me being as she went sailing to the old country the same day when on her recommendation i came to this very front door well well no matter about that you have been in mr leavenworth's family a year yes sir and liked it found him a good master oh sir never have i found a better a worse look to the villain has killed him he was that free and generous sir that many's the time i have said to hannah she stopped with a sudden comical gasp of terror looking at her fellow-servants like one who had incautiously made a slip the coroner observing this inquired hastily hannah who is hannah the cook drawing her roly-poly figure up into some sort of shape in her efforts to appear unconcerned exclaimed boldly she uh, oh only the lady's maid sir but i don't see any one here answering that description you didn't speak of any one by the name of hannah as belonging to the house said he turning to thomas uh, no sir the latter replied with a bow and a sidelong look at the red-cheeked girl at his side you asked me who were in the house at the time the murder was discovered and i told you oh cried the coroner satirically used to police courts i see then turning back to the cook who had all this while been rolling her eyes in a vague fright about the room inquired and where is this hannah uh, sure sir she's gone how long since the cook caught her breath hysterically since last night what time last night uh, true sir i don't know i don't know anything about it was she dismissed not as i knows on her clothes is here oh her clothes are here at what hour did you miss her i didn't miss her she was here last night and she wasn't here this morning and so i says she's gone hm cried the coroner casting a slow glance down the room while every one present looked as if a door had suddenly opened in a closed wall where did this girl sleep the cook who had been fumbling uneasily with her apron looked up sure we all sleeps at the top of the house sir in one room slowly yes sir did she come up to the room last night yes sir at what hour uh, sure it was ten when we all came up i heard the clock a striking did you observe anything unusual in her appearance she had a toothache sir oh a toothache what then tell me all she did but at this the cook broke into tears and wails sure she didn't do nothing sir it wasn't her sir as did anything don't you believe it hannah's a good girl and honest sir as ever you see i'm ready to swear on the book as how she never put her hand to the lock of his door what should she for she only went down to miss eleanor for some toothache drops her face was paining her awful and oh sir there there interrupted the coroner i am not accusing hannah of anything i only asked you what she did after she reached your room she went downstairs you say how long after you went up troth sir i couldn't tell but molly says never mind what molly says you didn't see her go down no sir nor see her come back no sir nor see her this morning uh, no sir how could i when she's gone but you did see last night that she seemed to be suffering with toothache yes sir very well now tell me how and when you first became acquainted with the fact of mr leavenworth's death 
but her replies to this question, while over garrulous, contained but little information. And seeing this, the coroner was on the point of dismissing her, when the little juror, remembering an admission she had made, of having seen Miss Eleanor Leavenworth coming out of the library door a few minutes after Mr. Leavenworth's body had been carried into the next room, asked if her mistress had anything in her hand at the time. "'I don't know, sir. Faith!' she suddenly exclaimed. "'I believe she did have a piece of paper. I recollect now, seeing her put it in her pocket.' The next witness was Molly, the upstairs girl. Molly O'Flanagan, as she called herself, was a rosy-cheeked, black-haired, pert girl of about eighteen, who, under ordinary circumstances, would have found herself able to answer, with a due degree of smartness, any question which might have been addressed to her. But fright will sometimes cower the stoutest heart, and Molly, standing before the coroner at this juncture, presented anything but a reckless appearance, her naturally rosy cheeks blanching at the first word addressed to her, and her head falling forward on her breast, in a confusion too genuine to be dissembled, and too transparent to be misunderstood. As her testimony related mostly to Hannah, and what she knew of her, and her remarkable disappearance, I shall confine myself to a mere synopsis of it. As far as she, Molly, knew, Hannah was what she had given herself out to be, an uneducated girl of Irish extraction, who had come from the country to act as lady's maid and seamstress to the two Misses Leavenworth. She had been in the family for some time, before Molly herself, in fact, and though by nature remarkably reticent, refusing to tell anything about herself or her past life, she had managed to become a great favourite with all in the house. But she was of a melancholy nature and fond of brooding, often getting up nights to sit and think in the dark. "'As if she was a lady!' exclaimed Molly. This habit being a singular one for a girl in her station, an attempt was made to win from the witness further particulars in regard to it, but Molly, with a toss of her head, confined herself to the one statement. She used to get up nights and sit in the window, and that was all she knew about it. Drawn away from this topic, during the consideration of which a little of the sharpness of Molly's disposition had asserted itself, she went on to state, in connection with the events of the past night, that Hannah had been ill for two days or more, with a swelled face, that it grew so bad after they had gone upstairs the night before, that she had got out of bed, and dressing herself, Molly was closely questioned here, but insisted upon the fact that Hannah had fully dressed herself, even to arranging her collar and ribbon, lighted a candle, and made known her intention of going down to Miss Eleanor for aid. "'Why, Miss Eleanor?' a juryman here asked. "'Oh, she is the one who always gives out medicines and such like to the servants.' Urged to proceed, she went on to state that she had already told all she knew about it. Hannah did not come back, nor was she to be found in the house at breakfast-time. "'You say she took the candle with her?' said the coroner. "'Was it in a candlestick?' "'No, sir. Loose-like.' "'Why did she take a candle? Does not Mr. Leavenworth burn gas in his halls?' "'Yes, sir, but we put the gas out as we go up, and Hannah is afraid of the dark.' "'If she took a candle, it must be lying somewhere about the house. Now, has anybody seen a stray candle?' "'Not as I knows on, sir.' "'Is this it?' exclaimed a voice over my shoulder. It was Mr. Grice, and he was holding up into view a half-burned paraffin candle. "'Yes, sir. Law, where did you find it?' "'In the grass of the carriage yard, halfway from the kitchen door to the street,' he quietly returned. Sensation! A clue, then, at last! Something had been found which seemed to connect this mysterious murder with the outside world. Instantly the back door assumed the chief position of interest. The candle found lying in the yard seemed to prove not only that Hannah had left the house shortly after descending from her room, but had left it by the back door, which we now remembered was only a few steps from the iron gate opening into the side street. But Thomas, being recalled, repeated his assertion that not only the back door, but all the lower windows of the house had been found by him securely locked and bolted at six o'clock that morning. Inevitable conclusion 
someone had locked and bolted them after the girl. Who? Alas, that had now become the very serious and momentous question. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Expert Testimony And oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. Macbeth In the midst of the universal gloom thus awakened, there came a sharp ring at the bell. Instantly all eyes turned towards the parlour door, just as it slowly opened, and the officer who had been sent off so mysteriously by the coroner an hour before entered, in company with a young man, whose sleek appearance, intelligent eye, and general air of trustworthiness seemed to proclaim him to be, what in fact he was, the confidential clerk of a responsible mercantile house. Advancing without apparent embarrassment, though each and every eye in the room was fixed upon him with lively curiosity, he made a slight bow to the coroner. "'You have sent for a man from Bone and Co.?' he said. Strong and immediate excitement. Bone and Co. was the well-known pistol and ammunition store of Broadway. "'Yes, sir,' returned the coroner. "'We have here a bullet, which we must ask you to examine. You are fully acquainted with all matters connected with your business.' The young man, merely elevating an expressive eyebrow, took the bullet carelessly in his hand. "'Can you tell us from what make of pistol that was delivered?' The young man rolled it slowly round between his thumb and forefinger, and then laid it down. "'It's a number thirty-two ball, usually sold with a small pistol made by Smith and Wesson.' "'A small pistol!' exclaimed the butler, jumping up from his seat. "'Master used to keep a little pistol in his stand drawer. I've often seen it. We all knew about it. Great and irrepressible excitement, especially among the servants. That's so, I heard a heavy voice exclaim. I want sorry myself. Master was cleaning it. It was the cook who spoke. In his stand drawer? the coroner inquired. Yes, sir, at the head of his bed. An officer was sent to examine the stand drawer. In a few moments he returned, bringing a small pistol, which he laid down on the coroner's table, saying, "'Here it is.' Immediately every one sprang to his feet, but the coroner, handing it over to the clerk from Bones, inquired if that was the make before mentioned. Without hesitation he replied, "'Yes, Smith and Wesson, you can see for yourself.' And he proceeded to examine it. "'Where did you find this pistol?' asked the coroner of the officer. "'In the top drawer of a shaving-table, standing near the head of Mr. Leavenworth's bed, "'it was lying in a velvet case together with a box of cartridges, "'one of which I bring as a sample.' "'And he laid it down beside the bullet. "'Was the drawer locked?' "'Yes, sir, but the key was not taken out.' "'Interest had now reached its climax. "'A universal cry swept through the room. "'Is it loaded?' "'The coroner, frowning on the assembly, with a look of great dignity, remarked, I was about to ask that question myself, but first I must request order. An immediate calm followed. Every one was too much interested to interpose any obstacle in the way of gratifying his curiosity. Now, sir, exclaimed the coroner. The clerk from Bones, taking out the cylinder, held it up. There are seven chambers here, and they are all loaded. A murmur of disappointment followed this assertion. But, he quietly added, after a momentary examination of the face of the cylinder, they have not all been loaded long. A bullet has been recently shot from one of these chambers. How do you know? cried one of the jury. How do I know? Sir, he said, turning to the coroner, will you be kind enough to examine the condition of this pistol? And he handed it over to that gentleman. Look first at the barrel. It is clean and bright, and shows no evidence of a bullet having passed out of it very lately. That is because it has been cleaned. But now observe the face of the cylinder. What do you see there? I see a faint line of smut near one of the chambers. Just so. Show it to the gentleman. It was immediately handed down. That faint line of smut on the edge of one of the chambers 
is the tell-tale, sirs. A bullet passing out always leaves smut behind. The man who fired this, remembering the fact, cleaned the barrel, but forgot the cylinder. And stepping aside, he folded his arms. Jerusalem! spoke out a rough, hearty voice. Isn't that wonderful? This exclamation came from a countryman who had stepped in from the street, and now stood agape in the doorway. It was a rude, but not altogether unwelcome interruption. A smile passed round the room, and both men and women breathed more easily. Order being at last restored, the officer was requested to describe the position of the stand, and its distance from the library table. The library table is in one room, and the stand in another. To reach the former from the latter, one would be obliged to cross Mr. Leavenworth's bedroom in a diagonal direction, pass through the passageway separating that one apartment from the other, and— "'Wait a moment. How does this table stand in regard to the door which leads from the bedroom into the hall?' "'One might enter that door, pass directly round the foot of the bed to the stand, procure the pistol, and cross halfway over to the passageway, without being seen by any one sitting or standing in the library beyond.' "'Holy Virgin!' exclaimed the horrified cook, throwing her apron over her head, as if to shut out some dreadful vision. "'Hannah never would have had the pluck for that. Never, never!' But Mr. Grice, laying a heavy hand on the woman, forced her back into her seat, reproving and calming her at the same time, with a dexterity marvellous to behold. "'I beg your pardons,' she said depreciatingly to those around. "'But it never was, Hannah, never.' The clerk from Bones here being dismissed, those assembled took the opportunity of making some change in their position, after which the name of Mr. Harwell was again called. That person rose with manifest reluctance. Evidently the preceding testimony had either upset some theory of his, or indubitably strengthened some unwelcome suspicion. "'Mr. Harwell,' the coroner began, "'we are told of the existence of a pistol belonging to Mr. Leavenworth, and upon searching we discover it in his room. Did you know of his possessing such an instrument?' "'I did.' "'Was it a fact generally known in the house?' "'So it would seem.' "'How was that? Was he in the habit of leaving it around where any one could see it?' "'I cannot say. I can only acquaint you with the manner in which I myself became aware of its existence.' "'Very well, do so.' "'We were once talking about firearms.' I have some taste that way, and have always been anxious to possess a pocket pistol. Saying something of the kind to him one day, he rose from his seat, and, fetching me this, showed it to me. How long ago was this? Uh, some few months since. He has owned this pistol, then, for some time? Yes, sir. Is that the only occasion upon which you have ever seen it? "'No, sir,' the secretary blushed. "'I have seen it once since. "'When?' "'About three weeks ago. "'Under what circumstances?' "'The secretary dropped his head, "'a certain drawn look making itself suddenly visible on his countenance. "'Will you not excuse me, gentlemen?' "'He asked after a moment's hesitation. "'It is impossible,' returned the coroner. His face grew even more pallid and deprecatory. "'I am obliged to introduce the name of a lady,' he hesitatingly declared. "'We are very sorry,' remarked the coroner. The young man turned fiercely upon him, and I could not help wondering that I had ever thought him commonplace. "'Of Miss Eleanor Leavenworth,' he cried. At that name, so uttered, everyone started but Mr. Grice. He was engaged in holding a close and confidential conflab with his finger-tips, and did not appear to notice. "'Surely it is contrary to the rules of decorum and the respect we all feel for the lady herself to introduce her name into this discussion,' continued Mr. Harwell. But the coroner, still insisting upon an answer, he refolded his arms, a movement indicative of resolution with him, and began in a low, forced tone to say, "'It is only this, gentlemen.' One afternoon, about three weeks since, I had occasion to go to the library at an unusual hour. Crossing over to the mantelpiece for the purpose of procuring a penknife, 
which I had carelessly left there in the morning, I heard a noise in the adjoining room. Knowing that Mr. Leavenworth was out, and supposing the ladies to be out also, I took the liberty of ascertaining who the intruder was, when, what was my astonishment to come upon Miss Eleanor Leavenworth, standing at the side of her uncle's bed, with his pistol in her hand. Confused at my indiscretion, I attempted to escape without being observed, but in vain, for just as I was crossing the threshold she turned, and, calling me by name, requested me to explain the pistol to her. Uh, gentlemen, in order to do so, I was obliged to take it in my hand, and that, sirs, is the only other occasion upon which I ever saw or handled the pistol of Mr. Leavenworth. Drooping his head, he waited in indescribable agitation for the next question. "'She asked you to explain the pistol to her. What do you mean by that?' "'I mean,' he faintly continued, catching his breath, in a vain effort to appear calm, "'how to load, aim, and fire it.' A flash of awakened feeling shot across the faces of all present. Even the coroner showed sudden signs of emotion, and sat staring at the bowed form and pale countenance of the man before him, with a peculiar look of surprised compassion, which could not fail of producing its effect, not only upon the young man himself, but upon all who saw him. "'Mr. Harwell,' he at length inquired, "'have you anything to add to the statement you have just made?' The secretary sadly shook his head. "'Mr. Grice,' I here whispered, clutching that person by the arm, and dragging him down to my side, "'assure me, I entreat you,' but he would not let me finish. "'The coroner is about to ask for the young ladies,' he quickly interposed. "'If you desire to fulfil your duty towards them, be ready, that's all.' "'Fulfil my duty?' The simple words recalled me to myself. What had I been thinking of? Was I mad? With nothing more terrible in mind than a tender picture of the lovely cousins bowed in anguish over the remains of one who had been as dear as a father to them, I slowly rose, and upon demand being made for Miss Mary and Miss Eleanor Leavenworth, advanced and said that, as a friend of the family, a petty lie which I hope will not be laid up against me, I begged the privilege of going for the ladies and escorting them down. Instantly a dozen eyes flashed upon me, and I experienced the embarrassment of one who, by some unexpected word or action, has drawn upon himself the concentrated attention of a whole room. But the permission sought being almost immediately accorded, I was speedily enabled to withdraw from my rather trying position, finding myself, almost before I knew it, in the hall, my face aflame, my heart beating with excitement, and these words of Mr. Grice ringing in my ears, Third floor, rear room, first door at the head of the stairs. You will find the young ladies expecting you. So I think chapter five is another one of those chapters where people perhaps were saying, gosh darn it, this couldn't have been written by a woman, because expert testimony from a bullet expert, what? Or at least a gun expert. First off, dude sounds like he's on CSI, because, well, I, I know that this bullet came from a Smith & Wesson that was manufactured in May last year. I mean, wow, they knew stuff back then. I mean, they couldn't necessarily do the really sophisticated measurements of rifling on the bullet all that stuff maybe maybe not but can tell when the thing was fired recently and can tell that somebody cleaned everything except the one place that they should have cleaned so somebody who perhaps didn't know quite so much about guns as as they thought or that as they wanted to know loved hannah the cook i loved that when there was this whole no, I didn't miss her. <laughs> she wasn't there. <laughs> and, and no, how could I see her when she's gone? Followed up by Thomas the butler saying, well, you asked me who was in the house. And she wasn't in the house, so I didn't mention her. And the coroner coming back with, oh, so you're used to police courts, I see. Snark, snark. Like, 
Don't be smart with me, mister. <laughs> I'm the coroner. Interesting backstory on Hannah from Molly, that Hannah is a melancholy girl, interesting, who sits around as though she were, you know, rich, staring out the window, thinking of better days that she should be having. I also loved Mr. Grice's entrance into this part of the story. You mean this candle? <laughs> it's just too perfect. I love him. I also loved that in chapter five, there was the, the, suddenly somebody says, Jerusalem, yeah, that's incredible. And it's just some guy who wandered in off the street. <laughs> it's like, hey, there's a party going on. I should go see if they've got some food or something. Plus, I heard there was a murder there last night, so this could be interesting. <laughs> so the next time that Grace gets mentioned is as soon as Eleanor is brought up in relationship to this particular weapon. Grice is having the confab with his fingertips. <laughs> you know, just paying attention like you do, or like I do. I also loved that as soon as Mr. Raymond realizes that he is suddenly going to need to be useful instead of just watching things, he gets up to go get the women, and before he can ask, Grice says, in the back, up the stairs, top of the stairs, <laughs> that's where you're going to find the ladies. Oh, Mr. Raymond, next week we meet ourselves some ladies, and that is going to be fun. So, shorter episode today, longer week for Heather, and long day ahead of me. So I hope you forgive me the brevity, but I hope you enjoyed the chapters. Ah, uh, fun. All right, more Inquest Revelations next week. You take care of yourself. Don't get caught up in any tornadoes yourself. Be well. Take care of each other. Wear a mask. Get vaccinated. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>